continuing the memory notes. So eidetic imagery. Eidetic imagery is a technical term for a photographic memory. So eidetic imagery can recall a memory in minute detail and portray the most interesting and meaningful parts most accurately. These images can last as short as a brief moment or as long as days. Eidetic imagery tends to be more common in children and seems to decline as a person's language abilities increases. So children who don't have as big of a vocabulary as us, they tend to see things in pictures as more. As you get older and you develop a better vocabulary, you know, it, it's not as much pictures as you can understand the meaning of things. The three stages of memory, right? So this was the series developed by Atkinson and Schifrin. Uh, we encode information and store it in one of three types of memory, depending on what we need the information for. Our memory works like an assembly line. And before information can make it to our long-term memory, it must first pass through sensory memory and working memory. So here's like the little assembly line, it's bomb, right? So you have some kind of external event, you know, usually it's something with our senses, right? Um, so you have that sensory input is input, you know, the raw information is taken in, whether it's something you smell, hear, see, that goes to your sensory memory. That's very short. Then it is encoded Right. So the, and when you encode it, you're, you're paying attention to the important or the new information because there's so much information that comes in. You can't pay attention to all of it. So encoding is where you're trying to make sense of that, the important information. Then it goes to your long term memory and it goes to your long term memory. Then from there, as we're going to learn, uh, most of it is actually lost. But then you encode it, you know, so you compare it to things that are already in your long term memory, making sense of it. And then you have to repeat it. And eventually, if it gets encoded, it can get stored in your long-term memory until you need it again, and then it's retrieval, right? So if you need it for, to answer a question, um, you know, answer, have a conversation, whatever it might be. So the first of the memories is the shortest. That's your sensory memory, all right? So sensory memory is the shortest of all of our memories. Make sure you know that. And generally holds sight, sound, smell, textures, and other sensory information for a fraction of a second, right? So this is less than a second long. Sensory memory holds a large amount of information, far more than ever reaches the consciousness. So Sperling's uh, experiment, which we'll show a slide of, and it's in your book, um, you know, he kind of shows this through the letters of rows, and then he would have this card you see, and then a tone to indicate which row to recall. Uh, sensory memory lasts just long enough to dissolve into the next one, giving us the impression of a constant flow, just like a motion picture. So, you know, we have each one that lasts a fraction of a second, but it's followed by another sensory memory and another sensory memory. And that's what gives us, you know, what we see, what, what we remember, you know, like, um, like a motion picture. So this is Sperling's test. So George Sperling flashed a group of letters. So you see this example on the left here. Um, for just a fraction of a second, right? One twentieth of a second. People could then recall only about half the letters when he just flashed it. But when he signaled to recall a particular row immediately after the letters disappeared with a specific tone, they could do so with near perfection. So when you combine the letters with a tone, like a tone or like a bell, you know, that that sensory memory, right, working together with the audio and visual, you were able to recall the letters. So sensory memory, we have a couple different types of sensory memory. We have iconic memory and echoic memory. So iconic memory is the memory is the momentary sensory memory of visual stimuli. A photographic or picture image memory lasting no more than a few tenths of a second. So obviously, you know, we try to use as many pneumatic devices as we can to, to learn this. So one that um, students like to use is iconic memory starts with I, right? And you use your eye to visualize things. So just think about visual memory is iconic, right? Starts with I and we use our eyes to see. Echoic memory is a momentary sensory memory of auditory stimuli. So even if attention is elsewhere, one can recall the words and sounds within three to four seconds. So an example of this could be, you could be watching uh, TV and still repeat the last line of what a person who you were not paying attention to just said. I'm sure this has happened to you before. Maybe your parents were talking to you, you weren't paying attention, um, or a teacher was talking to you and you weren't paying attention, but yet you were able to repeat the last things they just said to make it act like you were paying attention. 
and really you know you weren't um but because our quick memory lasts three or four seconds you can recall the last few things that they said so back in the day when we used to talk on the phone you do this all the time you weren't paying attention like oh you paying attention to me oh yeah and then you can repeat what they just said right to show that you were paying attention students try to pull this in class all the time I'm like no i i know what a quick memory is just because you're able to repeat the last things or if my kids do this i i know um that you weren't necessarily paying attention you have to go back more than three or four seconds so one way to remember this one a quick like echo right you guys all know what echo is so that's hearing or e starts you know with ear e ear uh, so those two different ways that students tend to remember a quick memory is their auditory stimuli. Not all sensory memory consists of images. Each sensory receptor actually has its own sensory register. Also, sensory images have no meaning associated with them. That is the job of the next stage working memory. So the sensory memory is just raw data. It's just, you know, when we talked about uh, sensation perception, right so this is just the sensation part not the perception not making sense of anything so each one has its own so we obviously we have visual stimuli or simulation which is the iconic memory auditory stimulation which is the echoic memory tactile stimulation tactile sensory all right so that's touch and then we have olfactory which we just learned about in the last unit so olfactory is your smell and then gustatory is taste. So those are your five senses. That's all the raw. So each one has its own register that processes it. Then it sends it to working memory. Working memory, right, or a short-term memory, that's where you make sense of what just came in, right? And then you send it to your long-term memory, you know, if it gets past working memory, which, you know, most things you end up forgetting. And then once it's in long-term memory, it stays there until you need it for something. So moving on to the next memory, the working or the short-term memory. So working memory is often known as short-term memory. It is the place where we sort and encode information before transferring it to long-term memory or forgetting it. So generally it holds information for about 20 seconds, far longer than sensory memory. So make sure you know the duration and the capacity of each memories. Um, so for working memory, it lasts about 20 seconds. Sometimes you might see a little bit longer, but it's about 20 to 30 seconds. Which we go over right here at the top. So working memory is subject to two limitations. Limited capacity, how much information you can have on there, which we're going to see in the next bullet point. And then it's a short duration, which we just talked about it lasts for about 20 seconds. So we know it lasts about 20 seconds and the limited capacity typically typically you only remember about seven pieces of information plus or minus two All right so george miller actually coined the phrase magical number seven plus or minus two so that means you can usually it's two less or two more so the range for short-term memory is about five to nine so typically about five to nine is what stays in our short-term memory now of course you can train your mind to remember more there's a, a teacher I know who has a student who um, usually we do this little like memory thing in class where I like list 12 words and you have to try to remember them and write them down. And usually almost everyone gets between five and nine. Well, this this teacher had uh, did the same thing and had someone who got all 12 and he was able to get up to 14. Right. And that's because his mom, when he went grocery shopping with her, used to make him memorize the grocery list. So he became just good at like memorizing things like that. Now, apparently it wasn't to um, make his memory good it was just to distract him so he wouldn't get in trouble but it you know worked out he he was able to train his short-term memory and now he has a pretty good short-term memory but you know how do we, that's not a lot of information so how do we get around that right so we have a lot of coping mechanisms right a lot of mnemonic devices uh, to deal with our short-term memory like chunking and rehearsal and things like that and that's what um, some of the next slides are going to be is all the different types of mnemonic devices that we use to increase our memory even though it's you know even though it has these limitations so visual encoding we have imagery which is just the use of mental pictures so you'll more likely remember the word cigarette as opposed to inherent so if you can visualize something you're more likely to remember it mnemonic right that just it's just a greek word um 
you know, it's, it's a memory aid. Uh, so there's a lot of different mnemonic devices that we use. So we have uh, peg word association is one. This requires you to memorize a jingle. So an example would be, and if anyone's done any quantum learning with any teachers, like Mr. Craig Mile does it, um, I'm not sure if he uses peg word association, but I know quantum learning does, and I know he does quantum learning. Um, there's been a few other teachers that have done it. Uh, what they do is you memorize a jingle. So this isn't the one they memorize, but here's an example of one. So one is bun, two is shoe, three is tree, and you, you have this jingle memorized all the way to like whatever number. So I've seen it done through like 20. So they have those 20 items memorized in a row. And then what they do is whatever the first word on that list is, they associate the bun. Right, so if the first word was yellow, they're like, okay, yellow bun, because they already have the bun memorized. Now you just associate whatever you're trying to remember with the thing you already have memorized, right? That's called peg word association. Method of loci, a technique for remembering uh, used since classical times. So a lot of times they use this, even like the ancient Greeks when they were porting, performing plays and tragedies and things like that. So what this is, uh, you think of an item and an idea and save it in a location or with an object that is familiar to you, making a new link between the item of recall and the item already stored into your long-term memory. So the idea of this is that you already have something stored in your long-term memory. If you put the new thing with the old, right, the old is already there, so then you're more likely to remember the new. So an example to remember a teddy bear, right? Think of a destination and put the teddy there. Now there are more links to prompt you into recall of the Teddy, even if you lose the link directly from the Teddy to your long-term memory, right? So it's all about making as many connections as you can. That's why like with teaching, you know, and learning, you know, teachers tell students to try to learn in, in as many different ways as possible, because the more connections you can make, the more likely you are to remember it. Chunking. A chunk is any memory pattern or meaningful unit of memory. So by creating chunks, a process called chunking, we can fit more information into the seven available slots of working memory. So think about like the example here is a phone number, All right? Phone number is, what's that, 10 digits? That's more than our working memory allows. But if you chunk it, think about when you say a phone number, right? Usually you say in three chunks, like the area code, you know, so this would be like 503-657-4100, right? So you chunk it, Makes it easy. So back in the day before cell phones, so like I didn't get my first cell phone until I think I got a family cell phone like in high school. So before that, if I, you know, if I wanted someone's phone number or, you know, I had a friend's phone number, I had to memorize them, right? So if I wanted someone's phone number, I had to memorize that to call them. In fact, I still know, I think my girlfriend's phone number from high school. I think I, I did until recently, I think remembered my phone number from when I was like a little kid, like. 30 years ago. So, and that's because you just got good at doing things like this because you have to. Now, I couldn't tell you my best friend's phone number because it's just in my cell phone. So you just go there and you call it. Rehearsal. This is kind of like the old way of remembering things that they used to do in school. So another memory technique is called maintenance rehearsal. This is a process where information is repeated to keep it from fading while in working memory. This process does not involve active elaboration assigning meaning to the information. So this is just repeated. If you look at the diagram, you got sensory input, goes to your sensory register, some of it's forgotten. Then it goes to your short-term memory, then some of it's forgotten. Then you keep rehearsing it, some of it's forgotten, and then eventually some of it goes to your long-term memory. Back in the day, they used to make you like write your spelling words like a hundred times, or if you got in trouble, you had to write like the the rules a hundred times. You know, whatever it was is is all about just repeating. Now that does work, but it doesn't work as well as you making a connection to or different connections to it like that. But it does work. But that's the, kind of like the old way of doing it. An acronym, an abbreviation of several words in such a way that the abbreviation itself forms a pronounceable word. And so a lot of times people don't even realize there's words out there that aren't actual words, but are acronyms. So here are some that a lot of people know, like AA is Alcoholics Anonymous, AC is Air Conditioning, RIP is Rest in Peace. Um, and now with like texting, you know, since it's been prevalent the last couple of decades, obviously you have a ton more um, that people use as, as a text now and, you know, use social media. Uh, but some words like radar is actually an acronym. Each letter actually stands for something. And there's a bunch of words like that that people don't realize are actually acronyms. Levels of processing. 
So in working memory, information can be elaborated on or connected with long-term memories. The levels of processing theory says that information that is more thoroughly connected to meaningful items in long-term memory will be remembered better, right? So you can kind of see that little diagram there. But that makes sense if you think about it. You know, if it's if you can connect it to something that's meaningful to you, you're more likely to remember it. So the location of working memory. So while the location in the brain of all three stages of memory are not fully understood, the likely location of working memory is the frontal cortex. All right, so we talked about the frontal cortex, you know, because it deals with all the decision making and processing of stuff. You know, we think that working memory is part of the frontal lobe, where we know like new memories is in the hippocampus once it's stored. So forgetting. Ebbinghaus. So this is Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve, something you should know. So he developed this forgetting curve, and what it says is one forgets rapidly initially, and then it levels off with time. So if I say something and then, and then immediately ask you what I just said, you, we pretty much have 100% recall of that. Um, within just 19 minutes, you can only recall about 90, or about sorry, about 60, less than 60% of what I said. Less than half the time. Or sorry, so about an, more than an hour later, uh, you remember less than half I said. So if we were in class, by the time you got to the next class, you're remembering less than half of what just went on in that class. After a day, you remember about a third, right? So you remember, so the next day, let's say you're in class, and the next day you come to class, you remember about a third of what happened in that day. And then two days later, you remember about a quarter of it. But after that, you know, you remember most, after two days, if you still remember what was going on in that class, um, about six days later, you know, you, you'll forget a little bit, but you remember most of it. A month later, once again, you're still remembering about 20% of it. So you're still remembering a lot of what you learned. And so that's what Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve says, is you have rapid uh, forgetting, right? So that's that short-term memory where a lot of it's forgotten. But once it gets that long-term memory, which, you know, by, by that second day, most of it's in that long-term memory, you're going to remember most of that. So once again, the Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve is you forget rapidly right away. You see this, you know, even after 19 minutes, you're, you've already forgot 40% of what you just learned. After an hour, more than half of what you just learned. After a day, two thirds of what you learned. But after that, now you're only losing a few percent the next day and even less after that. Proactive and retroactive interference. Uh, there is an acronym that we will learn to remember this, um, and that is called PORN. And the reason why everyone can remember it is because your teacher just said PORN, and I'll, um, we'll go over that with you shortly. So proactive interference occurs when something you learned earlier disrupts your recall of something you experienced later. So let's, let's say the example here is you learn a friend's email address at college, right? It's Fleming23 at mymail.edu. Um, so that's going to interfere with something you recall later. So then they get a new email address when they get out of college, and that's, you know, nfleming at, you know, yahoo.com. Well, you keep getting it mixed, mixed up with the old email, right? So the old information is interrupting the new thing you learn. Retroactive interference is the opposite of that. So it occurs when new information makes it harder to recall something you learned earlier. So example here is you can no longer recall your password for your ATM, right? Your PIN for your ATM. Um, because you've learned the password, so you got a new debit card. And so, you know, you have a PIN or a password for that debit card. Now you keep messing up the old PIN, right? So now when you go to your other bank or your other credit card, whatever it is, you keep messing up your PIN or your password for it. So think about, and this could work both ways for like lockers, right? So new school year and... You have, um, you know, you learned your new locker combination. Well, then you go to the gym, and now you forgot your old locker combination at the gym because you messed it up with your new combination, right? So I'll show you, like, I, ha I have kind of like a sheet with this. But if you think of porn, everyone knows how to spell porn, right? And everyone can remember porn because you're talking about porn in class. So P-O-R-N, right? So proactive is the P. The O is old information interrupts new information. The R is retroactive. And then the end is new information interrupts old. So most people tend to remember that because they 
remember the acronym that your teacher just said. All right, moving on to repression. Repression proposed by Freud. This is one of his defense mechanisms, which we'll talk about in a future unit. And we've talked a little bit about already some of his defense mechanisms. So what he said is um, it's a defense mechanism that banishes from consciousness anxiety, arousing thoughts, feelings, and memories. So repression is when you forget something happened to you. So usually something traumatic happened to you, and you've literally repressed those thoughts, so you forgot about them. You don't remember them anymore, so you can kind of live a normal life without anxiety. But – to counter that, a lot of people don't agree with that anymore because of the flashbulb memory. So a lot of people say when something traumatic happens to you, that tends to be more of a flashbulb memory than repression. So there's a lot of uh, controversy you know, with those theories. All right, the last slide. Uh, first thing we talk about is misinformation effects. So that's one thing that we'll, we'll talk a lot about and with Elizabeth Loftus. So she incorporated misleading information into one's memory of an event. So remembering it was a red Corvette that was speeding instead of it was a red station wagon that was speeding. So we're going to talk a little bit about this with the next set of notes with long-term memory. But pretty much is you take an information. So you, you think you're telling the truth, but really you're, you're mixing in other details into your memory, and that leads to a misinformation. Kind of like the dream I was talking about with like deja vu. Like you kind of take two different memories and you combine them and you don't know exactly what happened. Like I'm sure you've experienced something with someone else and you have two totally different stories of what happened, right? Because you kind of combine information. It's not like you're trying to lie, but that's just kind of what happened. So she, Elizabeth Loftus has actually um, testified in court a lot about like eyewitness memory and we're going to uh, – you're going to read about a case with eyewitness memory, which is just a crazy case. Source amnesia, where one retains a memory of the event, but not the context in which it was acquired. So an example, like I dreamt that I ran into so-and-so at the mall, and now I don't know if it was real or not. I'm sure this happened to you guys where something happened and you're like, did that, did that really happen? Sometimes you ask someone like, did I have that conversation with you or not? Because I know I did in my mind. I just don't know if I did, you know, in reality. And the last thing is the tip of the tongue phenomenon, right? When experienced tip of the tongue phenomenon, people feel that the blocked word is on the verge of being recovered, right? So you're like, oh, I, I have it. It's, it's, it's at the tip of my tongue. I'm trying to get it out. It's like it was just there, and then I can't think of it anymore, right? So that's the tip of the tongue phenomenon. And that is the end of the memory notes, and then we just have long-term memory next.